Leto II is the one character in the original Dune series who can be seen as the ultimate Kwisatz Sadarak, and even more. Leto II's first act as a newly born infant is to assist his blind father in killing the Tleilaxu face dancer Skytail by lending Paul his eyes. Both Leto II and his twin sister Ganema are preborn, fully aware and having the same other memory abilities as their Kwisatz Haderach father and the Bene Gesserit. They are born this way in part from the legacy of their father's genes, but also as a result of the large doses of melange their mother Chani was forced to take in order to counter the effects of a contraceptive poison. The result of this greatly accelerates the birth process, causing the twins to be born prematurely. Leto II is named for Paul's father, while his sister is curiously named Ganema, which means a spoil of war in the Fremen language. At the end of Dune Messiah, the blind Paul wanders into the desert to die in the traditional manner, leaving the twins to be raised by the Fremen and his sister Alia, who acts as the regent of the imperial throne until their coming of age. Much of Children of Dune focuses on the growth and development of Leto II and Ganema as various plots begin to be aimed at them. With Paul Moadi Betrides gone from the throne, the various political factions begin to move against the Children and Alia, their intent to regain control of the space by whatever means necessary. In addition to this, when Sisia, one of Shaddam IV's daughters, seeks to return House Carino to imperial power, by attempting to murder the Atreides twins and placing Faradin, her son, back upon the Golden Lion throne. Alia, who is falling to the onslaught of her other memory, seeks solace in the fact that the twins who are preborn may also be abominations. As she descends into madness, the malevolent personality of the Baron Harkonnen sows seeds of distrust in her mind and urges her towards harming the twins who eventually flee from her control. As the plots resolve themselves, Leto II eventually meets his father in the desert, who has been alive all this time and masquerading as a mysterious blind preacher, often seen in Arakin denouncing the religion of Moadib. They discuss the Golden Path, and we discover that Paul's prescient vision of the future in this light is fading as his son takes control of mankind's destiny and begins to set a chain of events into action. I'm here to give purpose to evolution and, therefore, to give purpose to our lives, Leto said. Do you wish to live those thousands of years, changing as you know you will change? Leto recognised that his father was not speaking about physical changes. Both of them knew the physical consequences. Leto would adapt and adapt. The skin which was not his own would adapt and adapt. The evolutionary thrust of each part would melt into the other and a single transformation would emerge. When metamorphosis came, if it came, a thinking creature of awesome dimensions would emerge upon the universe and that universe would worship him. They do discuss the possible ways of proceeding down the golden path. Paul, refusing to let his son have his body, so that it may be enshrined and act as a cement for Leto II's vision. Leto II discusses the reasons behind the Golden Path with Paul and attempts to see if his father will return to the course he abandoned. They talk of an event in the far future called Kralizek, the Typhoon Struggle. The term comes from ancient Fremen legends and is described as the battle at the end of the universe. Leto II accepts the responsibility of the Golden Path and begins a process of metamorphosis by consuming vast quantities of melange and then merging his own body with the sand trout of Arrakis. It was this sacrifice that Leto II was, unlike his father, able to take upon himself. By abandoning his humanity and taking on the mantle of the worm, both physically and metaphysically, in its mythological and religious interpretations as Shai Halud and Shai Tan, he is able to bring about a harsh rule that forces humanity into a crucible. Through his machinations, 
This will direct humanity's evolution to allow mankind to survive the events of Kralizek by forcing mankind down the Golden Path. Leto becomes the Emperor, calling himself Ari, the Lion of the Atreides. He is at once and the same time Kwisatz Satarak, Preborn Abomination, and no longer human, as he is now in the early stages of his symbiotic metamorphosis. In conquering the multitude of personalities from his other memory, he has chosen one individual over all the others to keep the throng in check, that of Harum, without whom the distant future would not be. He persuades Faradin to remain at his court, with the false promise of betrothal and the offer of the position of imperial scribe and historian, giving him the name Hark al Ada, which means breaking of the habit. Faradin will be the male concubine of Ganema and produce her children, beginning the new breeding program under the god emperor's control. Leto II, however, announces that he will marry his own twin sister, although he is no longer capable of having children himself. The following extract between the newly established emperor and Faradin explains much of Leto II's new physiology and mentality, as well as providing excellent insight into his golden path. What must I understand? There's always a prevailing mystique in any civilization, Leto said. It builds itself as a barrier against change, and that always leaves future generations unprepared for the universe's treachery. All mystiques are the same in building these barriers. The religious mystique, the hero leader mystique, the messiah mystique, the mystique of science technology, and the mystique of nature itself. We live in an imperium which such a mystique has shaped, and now that imperium is falling apart, because most people don't distinguish between mystique and their universe. You see, the mystique is like demon possession. It tends to take over the consciousness, becoming all things to the observer. I recognise your grandmother's wisdom in these words, Faradin said. Well and good, cousin. She asked me if I were abomination. I answered in the negative. That was my first treachery. You see, Ganema escaped this, but I did not. I was forced to balance the inner lives under the pressure of excessive melange. I had to seek the active cooperation of those aroused lives within me. Doing this, I avoided the most malignant and chose a dominant helper thrust upon me by the inner awareness which was my father. I am not, in truth, my father or this helper. Then again, I am not the second Leto. Explain. You have an admirable directness, Leto said. I'm a community dominated by one who was ancient and surpassingly powerful. He fathered a dynasty which endured for three thousand of our years. His name was Harum, and, until his line trailed out in the congenital weaknesses and superstitions of a descendant, his subjects lived in a rhythmic sublimity. They moved unconsciously with the changes of the seasons, they bred individuals who tended to be short-lived, superstitious, and easily led by a god-king. Taken as a whole, they were a powerful people. Their survival as a species became habit. I don't like the sound of that, Faradin said. Nor do I, really, Leto said. But it's the universe I'll create. Why? It's a lesson I learned on June. We kept the presence of death a dominant spectre among the living here. By that presence, the dead changed the living. The people of such a society sink down into their bellies, but when the time comes for the opposite, when they arise, they are great and beautiful. That doesn't answer my question, Faradin protested. You don't trust me, cousin. Nor does your own grandmother. And with good reason, Leto said but she acquiesces because she must. Bene Gesserits are pragmatists in the end. I share their view of our universe, you know. You were the marks of that universe. You retain the habits of rule, cataloguing all around you in terms of their possible threat or value. I agreed to be your scribe. It amused you and flattered your real talent, which is that of historian. You've a definite genius for reading the present in terms of the past, You've anticipated me on several occasions. 
I don't like your veiled insinuations, Faradin said. Good. You come from infinite ambition to your present lowered estate. Didn't my grandmother warn you about infinity? It attracts us like a floodlight in the night, blinding us to the excesses it can inflict upon the finite. Danny Jesuit aphorisms, Faradin protested. But much more precise, Leto said. The Bene Gesserit believed they could predict the course of evolution, but they overlooked their own changes in the course of that evolution. They assumed they would stand still while their breeding plan evolved. I have no such reflexive blindness. Look carefully at me, Faradin, for I am no longer human. So your sister assures me, Faradin hesitated. Then, abomination? By the sisterhood's definition, perhaps. Harum is cruel and autocratic. I partake of his cruelty. Mark me well. I have the cruelty of the husbandman, and this human universe is my farm. Fremen once kept tame eagles as pets, but I'll keep a tame Faradin. Faradin's face darkened. Beware my claws, cousin. I well know my Sardaukar would fall in time before your Fremen, but we'd wound you sorely and there are jackals waiting to pick off the weak. I will use you well, that I promise, Leto said. He leaned forward. Did I not say I'm no longer human? Believe me, cousin, no children will spring from my loins, for I no longer have loins. And this forces my second treachery. Faradin waited in silence, seeing at last the direction of Leto's argument. I shall go against every Fremen precept, Leto said. They will accept because they can do nothing else. I kept you here under the lure of a betrothal, but there will be no betrothal of you and Ganima. My sister will marry me. But you... Marry, I said. Ganima must continue the Atreides line. There's also the matter of the Bene Gesserit breeding program, which is now my breeding program. I refuse, Faradin said. You refuse to father an Atreides dynasty? What dynasty? You'll occupy the throne for thousands of years. And mould your descendants in my image. It will be the most intensive, the most inclusive training programme in all of history. We'll be an ecosystem in miniature. You see, whatever system animals choose to survive by, must be based on the pattern of interlocking communities, interdependence, working together in the common design which is the system. And this system will produce the most knowledgeable rulers ever seen. You put fancy words on a most distasteful. Who will survive Kralizek? Leto asked. I promise you, Kralizek will come. You're a madman. You will shatter the empire. Of course I will and I'm not a man, but I'll create a new consciousness in all men. I tell you now that below the desert of Dune there's a secret place with the greatest treasure of all time. I do not lie. When the last worm dies and the last melange is harvested upon our sands, these deep treasures will spring up throughout our universe. As the power of the spice monopoly fades and the hidden stockpiles make their mark, New powers will appear throughout our realm. It is time humans learned once more to live in their instincts. Leto II's symbiosis with the sand trout vectors makes him virtually impervious to physical damage. Soon after his taking of the throne, Leto II demonstrates his apparent immortality to the Fremen naibs, and in doing so secures his dominance over them and their allegiance having little real choice in the matter. At this point, physically at least, Leto II still bears resemblance to a human being, the main notable difference being his new skin. The next time we encounter him is in God Emperor of Dune, where we follow the events leading up to the end of his rule some 3,500 years later. Leto is barely recognisable as a human anymore only his face still bearing any similarity to the physical form he once had. The change has been immense, and most of his human attributes have succumbed to the physiology of a giant sandworm. Leto II's physiological change 
has also had a direct impact on the ecology of Arrakis. In sharing the sandworm's physical traits he also, unbeknownst to anyone and only recorded in his private journals, shares their weaknesses. He is unsusceptible to the damage that can be inflicted by just about any kind of weapon, and his control of the little remaining amounts of melange prevent any kind of planetary attack on Arrakis. He is however vulnerable to water, just as the sandworms are. At the beginning of God Emperor of Dune, apart from his arms and legs which are tiny and stunted, only his face remains seemingly human. His arms and legs are vulnerable to attack, and Leto II uses a cart made by the Ixians to move about freely. We learn as the latest incarnation of Duncan Idaho attempts to assassinate him with a las gun aimed at his face, that the appearance of what seems to be his one remaining major human trait is in fact far removed from his original human physiology. He muses upon this after killing Duncan that his brain was no longer directly associated with his face, it was not even a brain of human dimensions anymore but had spread in nodal congeries throughout his body. In addition to these transformations, it is also important to note that the final physical and mental changes Leto II has undergone, as part of his own personal evolution from preborn to Kwisatz Sadarak and ultimately to God Emperor, are physically connected to his symbiosis with the sand trout vectors. His symbiosis is mentally linked to the control he maintains of other memory with the aid of the dominant personality of Harum. However, when threatened, the part of Leto II that comes from the worm takes over with frightening speed. This reaction is a violent subconscious defence mechanism that surprises even him, and he seemingly possesses no control over this. His major domo, Moneo Atreides, is always wary and on the lookout for signs that the worm has asserted control over Leto II, usually when he is angered greatly. The environmental transformation of Arrakis undertaken by the Fremen under the direction of Leet Kynes was later continued by Paul Moadib and his sister Alia. Although this process was seen as a long term endeavour, by the time of the events in Children of Dune, some 20 years later, it is noted that this transformation is having a negative effect on the sandworm population and will one day affect spice production. As part of the change that he has undergone, Leto II has completely altered the ecology of Arrakis, with only a small section of desert remaining called the Sarir, where he maintains his fortress. Leto II has carried on the ecological transformation to such a degree that the planet is no longer a hostile wasteland, but rather an Eden-like world. A mountain ridge has been moved and raised around the Sarir to limit its exposure to moisture from the seas beyond, and in its place is the Idaho River, the place of the God Emperor's demise. In addition to limiting the availability of desert on Arrakis, the roll on effect of this planetary alteration is to make the sandworms extinct, which in turn brings to an end spice production, which humans depend upon so heavily. The only remaining sand trout are the vectors that make up much of Leto II's sandworm like body. It is the God Emperor's intent upon his death which must take place in water, to one day return Arrakis to the desert it once was. When he eventually falls into the Idaho River, it is these sand trout vectors in his body that will start absorbing all the water and begin the life cycle of the sandworms once again. They will seek out water wherever they find it, and begin the ecological transformation of Arrakis. The last evolutionary transformation of the god emperor occurs as he dies, with the multitude of sand trout vectors swarming into the waters of the Idaho River, and beginning anew the changing of Arrakis back into a desert world. He explains to Hawaii Nori how this will happen, telling her that, a little pearl of my awareness, will go with every sandworm and every sand trout, knowing yet unable to move a single cell, aware in an endless dream. As the first drenching swept in from behind the sand trout overlappings, he stiffened and curled into a ball of agony, 
separate tribes of sand trout and sandworm produced a new meaning for the word pain. He felt that he was being ripped apart. Sand trout wanted to rush to the water and encapsulate it. Sandworm felt the drenching wash of death. Curls of blue smoke spurted from every place the rain touched him. The inner workings of his body began to manufacture the true spice essence. The death of the god emperor frees humanity from the oppression of his tyrannical rule and creates a power vacuum in the Imperium that results in the diaspora of the scattering, sending humanity out across the universe in diverse groups. His demise, deliberate, foreseen and necessary for the golden path and the survival of humanity, is in his mind fourfold. It is the death of the flesh, the death of the soul, the death of the myth and the death of reason, and all of these deaths contain the seed of resurrection. Humanity will emerge stronger out of the God Emperor's rule, and his breeding program has produced Siona, an Atreides bred to be invisible from prescience, the terrible ability that evolution in the spice melange has created, and which has produced both the Jihad of Moadib and the all powerful tyranny of the God Emperor. The result of the Bene Gesserit breeding program taken over by the God Emperor means that the offspring created by Siona as she mates with Duncan Idaho will produce individuals capable of one day helping humanity survive the ravages of Kralizek. One such descendant is Shiana, the wild desert girl who can control the worms having learned their language, a form of dance which creates a complex chaotic rhythm and who is able to hide from those with prescient abilities. After the rule of the God Emperor, the old political factions vie once again for ascendancy in the remnants of the Imperium. Of these groups, the Bene Gesserit and the Bene Tleilax are in the strongest positions, the Tleilaxu hoping their perfected face dancers will assure them supremacy, while the Bene Gesserit are once again in control of their breeding program, and equally important, the world of Arrakis. The Bene Gesserit have continued to purchase Duncan Idaho Golas from the Bene Tleilax, curious as to his potential for breeding and determined to understand why the God Emperor used him time and time again when he controlled their program. They have also continued to breed the ancestors of the Atreides line, still fascinated by the genes of the family that produced both the Kwisatz Haderach and the God Emperor. One such Atreides descendant is Miles Teg, the Bene Gesserit's highly skilled Supreme Bashar who commands their armies and is brought out of retirement at the beginning of Heretics of Dune. Miles is an exceptional individual and brilliant military commander, educated by the Bene Gesserit and possessing the abilities of a Mentat. He is the son of Janet Roxburgh, a Bene Gesserit of fish speaker heritage, and Losky Teg, an employee of Chum, chosen by the Bene Gesserit for their breeding program because of his gene potential. Teg is particularly noted for his strong resemblance to the original Duke Leto Atreides, and it is noted that he himself has sired children for the Bene Gesserit breeding program, one of particular significance being the Reverend Mother Darwi Odrad. The Bene Gesserit revealed to him his ancestry while testing him for the abilities bred into the Atreides by the God Emperor's breeding program, though it is revealed that Teg does not possess them. He is brought out of retirement to become the weapons master and tutor to the latest in a long line of Duncan Idaho Golas, and additionally is tasked with reviving the youth's original identity. This is to be done by Teg mainly because of his physical resemblance to Duke Leto Atreides, the original Idaho's lord and master. While instructing the Idaho Gola on Gamu, the keep is attacked by the Tleilaxu, during which Teg is able to flee with both Duncan and Lucilla. Lucilla has been tasked with sexually imprinting the youth by the Bene Gesserit so that they may control him better. They hide in a Harkonnen no globe, and Teg is able to restore Duncan Idaho's memories without allowing Lucilla to imprint the youth. Upon trying to escape from Gamu, Miles Teg is eventually captured while allowing Idaho and Lucilla to escape. It is his capture and consequent interrogation that creates a crisis point for Miles Teg similar to that used to restore Agola's original memories, 
causing an evolutionary leap and strange new abilities to spring forth in the aging Bashar. Miles Tegg's new abilities include a degree of prescience but otherwise bear no real resemblance to the Kwisat Sadarax of his Atreides ancestry. Tegg's capture, and then torture by the honoured Matres, is to be conducted by the use of a tea probe, though it is noted that the tea probe is not of Ixian manufacture. Tea probes are another machine evolution spurred by the various necessities of technological and genetic changes in the now defunct Imperium. The device is able to take the memories, thoughts and personality of an individual, whether they are living or dead, and store them in digital form for scrutiny. The tactical response used by the Bene Gesserit and others against such a device is to use the substance share, the presence of which in the body prevents the device from capturing an individual's personality. The tea probe used by the Honoured Matres however is a product of the scattering, and its design has been improved so that share no longer affects its use. Teg himself has never used such a device interrogating someone, and notes the Bene Gesserit prefer to use pain and their truth sensibilities rather than depend on such a machine. Teg suspects that there is something in this attitude of a hangover from the Butlerian Jihad, rebellion against machines that could copy out the essence of a human's thoughts and memories. Teg studies the device as it is used upon him, and his mentat trained mind begins to consider deeper the results that such a technological terror may achieve from plundering his personality. It is this observation that I believe is of great importance when discussing the nature of the enemy in the Dune series. Frank Herbert's death meant the seventh and final Dune novel was never completed, the crux of which was to focus on Kralizek and the end result of the Golden Path, where mankind would fight in a struggle for survival in a climactic battle against the unseen enemy. As Teg is tortured his understanding of the Gola technology, and in particular the creation of the Duncan Idaho Golas over the years, changes in a moment of intense observational scrutiny. An organic chain of responses existed within Teg. The machine could trace those out as though it made a duplicate of him. The share and his mentat resistance shunted the searchers away from his memories, but everything else could be copied. It will not think like me, he reassured himself. The machine would not be the same as his nerves and flesh. It would not have tag memories or tag experiences. It had not been born of woman. It had never travelled down a birth canal and emerged into this astonishing universe. Part of Tag's awareness applied a memory marker, telling him that this observation revealed something about the Gola. Duncan was decanted from an axolotl tank. The observation came to Teg with a sudden sharp biting of acid on his tongue, the tea probe again. Teg allowed himself to flow through a multiple simultaneous awareness. He followed the tea probe's workings and continued to explore this observation about the Gola, all the while listening for dit, dat and dot. The three puppets were oddly silent, yes, waiting for their tea probe to complete its task. The Gola. Duncan was an extension of cells that had been born of a woman impregnated by a man. Machine and Gola. An analysis on the Wikipedia website of the two mysterious characters of Marty and Daniel, who appear at the end of Chapter House Dune, presents two theories on the nature of these individuals. I believe that it is quite obvious that they were intended to be at least representatives of the enemy that will threaten humanity in Kralizek. The article presents Tupons's view that Marty and Daniel are in fact members of the new face dancers who have returned from the scattering. This conclusion could be an obvious one, despite Duncan Idaho at one point observing that if they were face dancers, they were not Skytail's face dancers. Those two people behind the shimmering net belong to no one but themselves. Herbert, however, never approached plot in a simplified manner and subterfuge by the author against the reader is not only a trademark of Frank Herbert, it is implicit in the actions and thoughts of many of his characters in the Dune series. Plans within plans within plans is a common motif of political action within the books, and it is quite likely that in presenting an elderly couple working in a garden who may have a slight resemblance to the face dancers was yet another deliberate deception. 
It is, however, possible face dancers of the scattering have in some way interacted with machine intelligence, and there is more than a suggestion or two that Marty and Daniel have some relation to the Tleilaxu. John C. Snyder's review of Sandworms of Dune, the second of a two part conclusion to the Dune sequence by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson, discusses the fact that Daniel and Marty are thinking machines. He notes that fans have waited over 20 years to find out who Daniel and Marty are, and apparently Frank Herbert's answer is that they're thinking machines who've been watching and waiting for 15 millennia. Snyder's review of Hunters of Dune also mentions the apparent disappointment of the characterization of the Great Enemy, finding them to be cartoonish and little different than Harkonnens with metal faces. Tegg's observations point to the nature of a Gola being a hybrid of human and machine technology. The Golas, it would seem, are as close to a violation of the tenets of the Great Convention that emerged post Butlerian Jihad. The fact that the universe of Dune is shaped so fundamentally by the resulting aftermath of this crusade against thinking machines that humanity's evolution is shaped by it to such a wide and varied degree would suggest that Herbert's idea of the great enemy returning was indeed that of machine intelligence. It is this idea that is carried on in Hunters of Dune and Sandworms of Dune, with the final Duncan Idaho, a new quiz at Sadarak, merging in symbiosis with machine intelligence in a similar way that Leto II does with the sand trout. It therefore would seem fair to say that Tuponce's suggestion was indeed incorrect, ignoring as most commentators do the importance of the Butlerian Jihad to the framework of the narrative, while at the same time it should be noted that Snyder does not understand this for the very same reason. Tegg's transformation in Heretics of Dune is, apart from his limited prescience, a development of his physical and perceptual abilities, rather than possessing the attributes of the Kwisatz Sadaraks. His body is able to physically accelerate to such a speed that his captors are unable to perceive his movements, allowing him to kill them and escape once again. Teg's transformation expends an incredible amount of energy, forcing him to consume vast amounts of carbohydrate rich foods while resting. He is able to gather an army around him, killing a great deal of honoured matres before returning to Rakis. Here he once again fights a holding action against the honoured matres, allowing Duncan, Shiana, and a single sandworm to flee to the Bene Gesserit homeworld of Chapter House. The planet of Rakis is destroyed along with Teg and his men, the honoured matres doing so to wipe out the sandworms and their legacy, namely those pearls of the tyrant's awareness, that continued to shape the events of the universe. Teg is recreated by the Bene Gesserit as a Gola in Chapter House Dune, their curiosity piqued by the unusual abilities he manifested after his torture on Gamu, in addition to returning to them one of their greatest military leaders. Once again the Bene Gesserit attempt to imprint a Gola under their control, and again this fails, the original Teg having been trained to resist these sexual techniques. The great heretic of the title of the fifth Dune novel leads the offensive against the honoured Matres, and later helps Duncan and Shiana escape the Bene Gesserit in the no ship he originally stole on Gamu. In a sense, Teg is a mirror to the young final Duncan Idaho Gola, possessing many of the same attributes. There is a certain degree of affinity between the two, developed by the shared stresses that both must go through as Golas, in order to have their memories restored. They are also very much pawns used respectively by the God Emperor and the Bene Gesserit for their breeding programs, and often manipulated by their sense of honour. Miles Tegg, prior to the final Kwisatz Haderach, is also one more unexpected evolutionary change occurring in the Atreides genetic line. The final Duncan Idaho is the latest in a number of Golas created by the Bene Tleilax for the Sisterhood in the final two Dune novels. The Bene Tleilax has seeded in the Idaho Golas manipulations of the original's genes with some hidden purpose that is to be used at a given time. As such, though they continue to produce Duncan Idahos for the Sisterhood, they periodically assassinate them, so that this hidden purpose may be unleashed at a given time. The final Duncan Idaho is saved from such a fate and has the singular memories of the original Idaho 
restored with the assistance of Miles Tech. However, this Idaho Gola goes through a second period of awakening to his original self that no other Gola of his kind has managed. The hidden purpose implanted by the Tleilaxu is to counter the sexual weapon of the Honoured Matres, with which they so readily and easily enslave men. Idaho has been conditioned with responses that are not just a match for the Honoured Matres sexual techniques, they far surpass them. When an Honoured Matre attempts to enslave Duncan in such a manner, she finds the tables turned against her. Abruptly, the flame engulfed his mind. Hidden places within him came alive. He saw red capsules like a string of gleaming sausages passing before his eyes. He felt feverish. He was an engorged capsule. Excitement flaring throughout his awareness. Those capsules! He knew them. They were himself. They were... All of the Duncan Idahos, original and the serial Golas flowed into his mind. They were like bursting seed pods denying all other existence except themselves. He saw himself crushed beneath a great worm with a human face. Damn you, Leto! Crushed and crushed and crushed, time and again. Damn you! Damn you! Damn you! He died under a Sardaukar's sword. Pain exploded into a bright glare swallowed by darkness. He died in a thopter crash. He died under the knife of a fish speaker assassin. He died and died and died. And he lived. The memories flooded him until he wondered how he could hold them all. The sweetness of a newborn daughter held in his arms. The musky odours of a passionate mate. The cascade of flavours from a fine Danian wine. The punting exertions of the practice floor. The exlotl tanks. He remembered emerging time after time, bright lights and padded mechanical hands. The hands rotated him and, in the unfocused blurs of the newborn, he saw a great mound of female flesh, monstrous in her almost immobile grossness. A maze of dark tubes linked her body to giant metal containers. Axlotl tank? He gasped in the grip of the serial memories that cascaded into him. All of those lives. All of those lives. Now, he remembered what the Tleilaxu had planted in him. The submerged awareness that awaited only this moment of seduction by a Bene Gesserit imprinter. But this was Morbella, and she was not Bene Gesserit. She was here, though, ready at hand, and the Tleilaxu pattern took over his reactions. Idaho senses more than just the use of these sexual techniques stored in his subconscious. Realising that the Bene Tleilax had intended him to kill the Honoured Matres when sexual conditioning was used against him. Instead, Idaho resists this, possibly because the act of attempted imprinting has fully restored all of his memories from every incarnation he has lived through both as the original Idaho and the numerous Golas that have followed. In that sense, Idaho has become a new kind of Kwisatz Sadarak. Only his memories are not of the male or female line, simply his own over thousands of years. He also possesses a limited form of prescient vision, though he himself does not have the Atreides ability to remain hidden from prescience. The Bene Gesserit, having decided that Duncan was suitable bait for the Honoured Matres, now realise his worth as a weapon against them. He is taken back to Rakus, where he will train men in the sexual techniques he has had implanted in his consciousness by the Bene Tleilax. Duncan, however, cannot be shielded by those with prescient vision, such as guild navigators, and as such, must remain on board the no ship, a virtual prisoner. He is also tasked with returning the memories of Miles Tegg to his newly created Gola body. As Duncan is confined to his ship, he begins to have prescient visions of an old man and woman who appear in a kind of shimmering net and seem to be working in a garden. He was aware when the vision came that he was not really seeing a net. His mind translated what the senses could not define. A shimmering net undulating like an infinite borealis. Then the net would part and he would see the two people, man and woman. How ordinary they appeared, and yet extraordinary. A grandmother and grandfather in antique clothing. 
bib coveralls for the man and a long dress with headscarf for the woman, working in a flower garden. He thought it must be more of the illusion. I am seeing this but it is not really what I see. They always noticed him eventually. He heard their voices. There he is again, Marty, the man would say, calling the woman's attention to Idaho. I wonder how it is he can look through, Marty asked once. Doesn't seem possible. He's spread pretty thin, I think. Wonder if he knows the danger. Danger? That was the word that always jerked him out of the vision. The elderly couple have what Idaho calls a godlike stability, and are aware of Idaho watching them, demanding on one occasion that he stop spying on them. Idaho has a number of recurring visions of the elderly couple, who we later learn are called Daniel and Marty. As Duncan escapes Chapter House with Shiana, Miles Tegg, the Jews of Gamu, and the last Tleilaxu master, Skytail, they are observed by the mysterious entities of Marty and Daniel, who joke about their escape. With Frank Herbert's death, the mysteries of Chapter House Dune's cliffhanger remained unanswered for over 20 years. The conclusion to the Dune series by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson reveal that Daniel and Marty are in fact machine intelligence, and that the great enemy that has pursued the honoured mattress from the edges of the scattering was in fact the return of the machines that humanity fought during the Butlerian Jihad. Duncan proves to be the ultimate Kwisatz Haderach, and is able to eventually bring about the end of Kralizek by merging in symbiosis with a machine intelligence and ending the conflagration between humanity and machine. This ultimately echoes the words of the unnamed philosopher in Erewhon, who notes that machines were to be regarded as a part of man's own physical nature, and that man is a machinate animal. Despite being unfinished, Herbert's exploration of evolution successfully exploits the ideas of Samuel Butler and Erewhon in two ways. They provide a strong sense of verisimilitude by creating a believable historic framework to the Dune series, based on Butler's projected time frame for machine evolution. Additionally, they also create a substantial and complex framework to house Herbert's own ideas on evolution. Herbert's lasting contribution to science fiction in the series is one that explores fully the many possibilities that evolution may present to the future of humanity, rather than examining any one particular strand. The notion that humanity's evolution can be linked to that of machines comes from Butler's curious observations based on Darwin's On the Origin of Species, and is one that is often considered in science fiction, though seldom to such a degree of investigation. As technology continues to embed itself in every aspect of our lives during this information age, even scientists speculate now that machines are evolving exponentially in their development rather than in a measured linear fashion. It is difficult to measure Herbert's attitudes towards artificial intelligence in relation to science fiction writing in a post-internet, post-cyberpunk era. This is because artificial intelligence remains a shadowy figure of evil in the Dune series, never actually tangible until the appearance of Daniel and Marty. It does however keep alive the ideas of Butler who was quite possibly the first science fiction writer to speculate on machine intelligence and evolution, and we can see this certainly in works such as the Matrix trilogy, which shows a startling resemblance between Paul Atreides and the character of Neo. The complexity and depth with which Herbert presents his outlook on evolution is still worthwhile, despite the reader having to guess for a long time what any given conclusion may have been. Whether this conclusion is satisfying or not, the completion of the work by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson provides answers to these questions that, based upon Frank Herbert's notes, at least hold merit in examining the direction that evolution was taking within the work. Evolution is a process by which life moves forward, adapts to new situations, and either flourishes or falls into extinction. Herbert saw evolution as ultimately part of the systems and subsystems that govern the natural universe from the human perspective. As such, this theme permeates all of the Dune series to such a degree 
that its interactions within the other major themes are of paramount importance to understanding the Dune series as a whole. In addition, carrying on Samuel Butler's questioning regarding the nature of machine evolution, Herbert successfully shows that humanity's dominant evolutionary trait lies in our ability to make tools. As the machines we create evolve, so do we, and that ultimately human evolution may well be helped or hindered by our relationship with the tools that we create, and the degree to which we rely upon them. With that in mind, I will now look at what Herbert considered to be initially the dominant theme of the Dune series, that of the catastrophic hero, and consider what happens to a society who follows such an individual who is not a normal man, but is in fact a superman. This superman is not just an individual created by the process of evolution, but a person bred through the necessity to escape the crutches created by humanity's reliance on highly evolved machines, which ultimately become detrimental to mankind's survival. 